The book of Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible and the final book of the Torah, which is the foundation of the Old Testament. Now, if you're already familiar with the Bible, then you know that the Old Testament focuses on the relationship between God and Israel, while the New Testament explores the teachings of Jesus and his followers. Now, in addition to all this, Deuteronomy is a pretty dense book. In fact, you can see I have a lot of material on this whiteboard. So if you want to be able to look at what I'm doing uh, in more detail or follow along, I have a link to our guide to Deuteronomy uh, in the description. So go ahead and click that if you want to see a photo of this whiteboard uh, while I'm going through this. Now the book of Deuteronomy falls into four main sections and they all center on Moses posing a choice to the people of Israel. He says you can choose between life in the land of Canaan, which God has promised them, and the blessings that come with following God, or death and destruction and exile if they choose to be disloyal to God. Everything about Deuteronomy is centered on this choice, and we're going to look at the four sections and how they all fit together so you'll have a better understanding of how this book flows. So, let's jump in. Now, Deuteronomy begins with a recap or an introduction that looks at everything that we've already seen in the previous four books of the Bible. That's Genesis, when God calls Abraham, who is the ancestor of Israel, and we also meet the patriarchs of the twelve tribes of Israel. And then in Exodus, we start seeing some of the narrative of Israel as a nation. So we get those ten plagues that God sends on Egypt to rescue Israel uh, from their, their slave masters. And uh, the people of Israel witness these plagues, these mighty miracles, which culminate in God parting the very sea for them. Uh, and then the people of Israel come to the foot of Mount Sinai. It's a mountain in the wilderness. And they see God's glory in the form of this fiery cloud at the top of the mountain. And now normally when we think about the people of Israel getting the Ten Commandments, the image that we have in our mind is Moses walking down the mountain with these big stone tablets, right? But in the book of Exodus, the Ten Commandments are originally given directly to the people from God. They're gathered at the foot of this mountain and they hear the voice of God. Every single one of them hears God say, these Ten Commandments. And then eventually Moses goes up the mountain. He is a prophet that goes between the people and God. He writes down God's laws and, and brings them down to the people. Uh, but Moses reminds people, not only did you see all these mir miracles, but you also heard the voice of God. And yet, right after they hear God give these Ten Commandments, which are the basic laws uh, for, for being in this new relationship of God being Israel's uh, God and provider and protector in Israel worshiping God, uh, they immediately break the, the first couple of commandments by uh, creating a different God, an idol, to worship. And then later on in the book of Numbers, we see the people of Israel uh, choosing to go back to Egypt. Uh, they would rather go back to Egypt and be enslaved there than trust God to bring them into the promised land. Uh, God says, I'm not going to let you go back to Egypt, but I'm not going to let you enter the land either. And so that generation dies off. And now there's a new generation that is right on the borderline of the land that God promised to them so many generations ago. And so that's where Moses says, you're about to enter this promised land. You need to make this choice. Are you going to obey God and keep his laws? Or are you going to do what the generation before you did and reject God and suffer the consequences? And Moses is really, really uh, hoping that people choose the blessings that come with obeying God. And so in light of everything that has happened in Israel's history up to this point, Moses says in the next section, when you get into the land, make sure you recommit yourself to the laws that God has given you. And he, he says that once they get into the land, then half the people should assemble on one mountain, uh, which is Mount Gerizim, and say all the blessings that will come to the people of Israel if they follow God's laws. And then the other half of the people should stand opposite uh, on Mount Ebal and say, and if we don't follow God's laws, then these are the curses that will come upon us. 
So once again, uh, they're going to be hearing the, the laws of God spoken from, uh, from, from a mountaintop down to them. Uh, and so Moses says, you know, he's, he's going to be dead by the time this happens. But once they get into the land, they should do this ceremony to recommit themselves to the law. But what is the law that they should read? Well, that's what most of Deuteronomy, uh, that's what most of Deuteronomy's content, that is, is, is all about. Uh, in fact, the name Deuteronomy just means second law or repeated law because the laws that Moses lays out in the bulk of Deuteronomy are often found elsewhere in the Torah. Uh, you, you see a lot of these laws in Exodus. You see a lot of them in Leviticus. You see many of them in Numbers. Uh, but some of them are unique to Deuteronomy. Uh, but if we were to boil all these laws down, Moses says you need to love God and obey God. And those are, those are the two main rules that Moses repeats throughout the book of Deuteronomy. Loving God uh, looks like a devotion to God and God alone. So just recognizing that this is the one God that an Israelite should worship. And that God should be worshipped in one place, at, uh, at his designated temple, whether it's the tabernacle, which is a portable temple that the people of Israel were using at the time of Moses, or the established temple that we find later on in the Old Testament uh, in the city of Jerusalem. And then, of course, no idols. You don't worship other gods. Uh, obeying God looks like maintaining a sense of reverence for him, uh, maintaining uh, a holiness like what we find uh, described in the book of Leviticus, uh, upholding social justice and looking out for the marginalized people, like the widows and the orphans and the foreigners. And there are even some laws that for their time, were very generous and progressive uh, towards, towards slaves and, and other people that didn't have uh, the power uh, in, in those ancient nations. And uh, another aspect of obeying God was being generous. Uh, you find a lot of tithing language. That's people giving a tenth of their resources uh, to either uh, the people that are serving God as priests or uh, to the people that don't have the means of, of making, uh, making any money or growing any food themselves. So uh, really, really important. O obeying God looks like not only maintaining a sense of, of holiness and reverence, but also uh, doing good and uh, showing respect and dignity uh, for, for other humans. And so Moses closes out this section by saying, uh, you, you need to do this ceremony and choose to love and obey God. Because uh, if you do, then things will go well. And if you don't, then God will expel Israel from the land that he's giving them. And if you read the rest of the Old Testament, uh, well, you know that's what happens. And Moses predicts that in the third section. In the third section, Moses looks toward the future. He gathers the people of Israel together and he says, I know that eventually you're going to be disloyal. And when that happens, you will be exiled. God will remove you from the land. You will end up being scattered to the nations. But he believes that after that, God will restore the people of Israel to their land and give them new hearts that will be able to truly love and obey God. Now, Moses says that they should still choose life. They should follow God. But even though eventually they won't, he believes that God will find a way to help them do it, which is very encouraging and hopeful note to end that third section on. In the fourth section, we start seeing the Torah come to a close. It's almost an appendix of, of different elements that, uh, that need to be tied together. So Moses is going to die. He's not going to enter the promised land. You can learn more about that in the book of Numbers. And so Joshua is named as Moses' successor. Joshua is going to be the one leading these people as they cross the, the river into the land of Canaan. Also, the law that Moses delivered to the people is written down. Very important. So we have uh, someone, uh, a human carrying on Moses' leadership and uh, some documents uh, that preserve Moses' teachings. Moses gives Israel a song that warns Israel of those consequences of disobeying God. And it's something that they uh, can sing if, they're, if they find themselves in a position of exile so that they remember why they're exiled. But he follows that up with a blessing for each tribe's future prosperity, uh, which, is, which is quite encouraging. 
And then, at the end of Deuteronomy and at the end of the Torah, Moses dies. He goes up a mountain to be with the Lord, and he never comes back down. And that's where the Torah ends. It leaves a few things unresolved, though. Uh, after all, we need to wonder, what will the people do? Will they do this ceremony once they enter the land? The Torah doesn't say. We find that out in the book of Joshua. Uh, if they get exiled, will God restore them? We start seeing that story much, much later on in the books of Kings and Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah. And then there's the question of, will there ever be another prophet like Moses? Because the Torah ends with Moses dying, and at the time that Deuteronomy was written, they say that there has never been another prophet like him. But that question becomes a lot more significant when we start looking at the New Testament, when people start asking questions about a certain character there. And that is the book of Deuteronomy. As you can tell, it's a very, very rich book and a very, very important book. And I hope that this overview has been helpful in giving you an idea of its structure. Now, if you want to know more about the book of Deuteronomy and more about every single book of the Bible and how they fit together, I would encourage you to check out my ebook, The Beginner's Guide to the Bible. There's a link to that in the description of this video. And if you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you do that, then I'll be able to notify you of the next video just as soon as it goes live. I'm Jeffrey with Overview Bible. Thanks for watching.